like to introduce to today's speaker, and today's speaker is uh, Dr. Howard Levine. He's the chief scientist for the ISS at the Kennedy Space Center. And uh, Howard, if you can go ahead and oh, before Howard, before you start, Howard, one other thing. We're going to do questions and answers today, and on your screens there's a little Q and A box because there are currently 144 participants. We're not going to have microphones. All your microphones will be muted. So if you have a question, please put it in the Q and A box, and then we'll try and answer them there or uh, direct those questions to Howard to be answered. So with that, Howard, do um, you want to go ahead and start your talk? Yep. Can you see my uh, presentation? I can. All right, very good. So uh, I'm going to cover quite a bit today, you know, forgive me for that, but I thought it would be good to give you, the community, scientists and engineers, just a very quick overview of the different hardware that's available for plant and microbial studies in space. So uh, I won't be spending, as you can see, much time on any one of but in general, uh, you know, the, the goal, as Bruce just said, is to educate you, the science community, uh, about the hardware capabilities relative to low Earth orbit, ISS, maybe free flyer, lunar orbit, gateway, and the lunar surface. So there's different levels of science that are possible at these different uh, uh, venues, you know, based on crew time and intrinsic science capabilities, like on there's a lot of capabilities that we won't have on Gateway. And the focus, the scope, will be uh, what's available within the next 10 years with the existing hardware. So I won't be talking about hardware that's yet to come. Uh, so it's essentially currently available hardware capabilities for plants and microbes. So I'm going to start off with um, uh, the simplest hardware that we have, and I, I think it's very relevant for, let's say, gateway type experiments, uh, the brick 60 canisters. These are anodized aluminum cylinders that have been used with 60 millimeter petri dishes to grow a variety of critters over time. Uh, there's no operational power. You can put 12 within each of these canisters. One goes on top of the other, so you can have 24 in total. You could put eight canisters into a single deck locker. There's pressure release valves at the top. It's a light type environment, and there's sampling slips that are available. The second uh, brick option here, the second one is instead of just 60 millimeter petri dishes, it's for 100 millimeter petri dishes called the brick 100. Uh, there's a semi-permeable membrane that you can uh, insert both on the top and the bottom. Uh, so now it's uh, uh, breathable uh, and it can accommodate nine 100 millimeter uh, feature dishes. And you can put three of these into a typo, typical mid-deck locker uh, storage space. Then we developed uh, what we call the BRIC 100 BC. The BC stands for vacuum. Uh, so in this case, there's rapid disconnect valves for filling the canister with selected gases. So for instance, if you have an experiment that you want to have conducted under 5% CO2, we can flush the unit with 5% CO2 and close it up and uh, you can do your experiment. Uh, six to nine of these can canisters can be accommodated within an ISS storage locker. And again, you know, you can put anything you want within it, but what we've used so far are the uh, 100 millimeter feature dishes or the 50 millimeter uh, conical tubes. Then we kind of took a step up in terms of complexity with the brick feature dish fixation unit. Uh, in this case, uh, we can fix the samples on orbit. So, uh, takes a 60 millimeter petri dish and you can put your biological specimens onto it, you seal it up, completely sealed. There's a uh, syringe compartment that contains one or two uh, fluids uh, of your design, separated by a septum. And then there's a uh, actuator, kind of like a glorified caulking gun that can take a uh, 
uh, a metal rod, and this would be an astronaut uh, clicking it, you can push down the fluid onto uh, your biological specimen. So with the two specimens, you could do a experimental treatment if you were so inclined, you know, on one day, and then the next day you could fix your sample. So this has been uh, very uh, useful for us. It only takes about two hours of crew time to do an experiment on the International Space Station. And then we set that up one level because we had a number of uh, investigators who were using uh, like a rabbit off the seeds that were germinated uh, producing seaweed in the deep space. So we added light emitting diodes on top. And there's a variety of uh, 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 light that you can use and they're changeable. So based on what the PI wants, we can accommodate that. And then uh, you saw last week, uh, uh, Julia Massa talked quite a bit about the veggie unit, the vegetable production system. So that was developed via very simple, easily sold, high growth volume. Uh, and in addition to growing uh, vegetables in space, it can support experiments designed to determine how plants respond to microgravity. So uh, we have some uh, peer-reviewed research that's been conducted with it. It, uh, it just utilizes the cabin environment for temperature control and CO2 uh, input. So there's, it has a you know, sophisticated light bank that uh, you know, can support plant growth, but it does not control the environment per se within the veggie uh, uh, compartment. And I've provided you with some uh, specs here, but there's the light bank. Uh, the, to date, the experiments have been done with these veggie plant pillows that Joy talked about last week, and you see six of the pillows. And the crew has been extremely happy uh, with the production of vegetables that they can uh, munch upon. So this is just an example showing you how science experiments can be conducted in the veggie. We, uh, so far, we have mostly relied upon these 10 by 10 centimeter petri plates that have just been inserted into veggie. Uh, and then uh, the plants can be photographed. Uh, uh, they can be uh, taken over to the uh, light microscopy module unit for microscopy. Uh, and they can be uh, removed and fixed into uh, Kennedy fixation tubes, which we have here. So this has been a very useful device that was developed at Kennedy. Uh, the astronauts can apply fixative chemical compounds to the toxic to these samples without going into a glove box. So it maintains the three levels of containment all within its design. And the KFTs have been used over 200 times on order with no weeks of chemical fixation. And there's a, a main tube where the sample goes, and then there's a, uh, a tube where you put the fixative, and we've used a variety of different fixatives to date. And we've demonstrated that the KFTs can maintain their containment at ambient temperatures, 4 degrees C, and minus 100 degrees C. So you can put them into Melfi uh, after use. And then uh, recently, for one of our PIs for APEX 6, this is the Patrice Masson experiment. Uh, he required, uh, he was using brachypodium, and he wanted to see his roots. Uh, we developed this apex growth chamber design, which is essentially uh, two magentas that can be coupled together, uh, and the astronaut can uh, insert the nutrient solution up into a foam substrate and the seeds are planted on the outside and you can have 12 of these under an individual uh, veggie unit. So here's some of the brachypodium with the roots visible for photography after the experiment. So uh, we're hoping to validate that on ISS uh, in the coming months. And then recently uh, we came up at Kennedy with Spectrum multi-spectral fluorescent imager. Uh, so this unit is a single midget clocker, and it does control chamber temperature, humidity, CO2, scrubs for VOCs, you know, the emphasis on uh, ethylene, 
and it also provides light at the top if you're growing a specimen on the petri plate, uh, let's say Arabidopsis petri. But essentially, uh, uh, when you want to uh, illuminate for fluorescent imagery your specimen, you, there's an excitation light source, with a filter wear uh, a wheel and a number of different kinds of filters so that uh, you can actually visualize for a variety of different uh, you know, fluorescent um, uh, proteins, like green fluorescent protein, red fluorescent protein, yellow fluorescent protein. And then uh, uh, particularly useful is TechShot Health, that's referred to as a multi-use variable G platform. Again, it's a single mid-deck locker with two centrifuges. So well, typically, one could operate uh, at 1G in space through a 1G control, and one can operate at microgravity with uh, no rotation or a very slight rotation just to avoid position effects. It uh, has thermal control, 12 sample modules. This is a sample module, six per centrifuge and two centrifuges. So there's 12, and uh, different module designs have been developed for different biology, for particular bacteria and plant seedlings. And TechShot also has a device called AdStep, the advanced space experiment processor. Uh, it has real-time monitoring and control of the cassette-based experiments. Uh, it supports three cassettes at a time. Uh, it can be operated during ascent, so that's very useful. And the sets are swappable on orbit, and you can do up to a six-month experiment. Uh, temperature can be controlled at 4 to 40 degrees centigrade, and it does have video and still uh, imagery and oxygen and CO2 monitoring and control. So here's a, a cold storage team uh, uh, heading up out of Johnson Space Center, but a definite partnership with the University of Alabama group in Birmingham. And they, uh, and, and of course, ESA has developed this Melfi freezer. So Melfi is a minus 80 degree laboratory freezer for ISS. There's three of them on ISS, and each of them has four independent stewards, which can be set to operate at different temperatures, use some of the different temperatures that can be, uh, can be set at. And then the uh, University of Alabama Birmingham group has developed these other active cold uh, assets, Glacier, Polar, and Merlin. And uh, they're both very reliable, all three of them are very reliable. They have different subtleties between them. Sometimes they hook into the moderate temperature loop on ISS to uh, assist in their cooling, but even without that, they can cool it just to a, a different range of temperature. Uh, oops. So those are active cooling assets, and there's also passive cooling. So this is non-powered hardware, uh, such as the double cold bag, the mini cold bag, ice bricks, and uh, some mesh bags, and the double cold bags are very much useful for bringing science to and from ISS. And the mini cold bags are used for smaller samples, uh, also for return on storage. So they all use preconditioned ice bricks. Uh, these can be conditioned into the active. Uh, cold assets that I showed on the previous slide uh, and the different temperatures and uh, usually this range, so all the way from minus 32 degrees C to plus 37 degrees C. And then there are the active freezing assets. So uh, there's no liquid nitrogen freezing capability on ISS basic consideration. But there's two options that have been developed uh, rapid freezing, not quite as good as liquid nitrogen, but this glove box freezer uh, can be mounted in the microgravity science glove box as shown here. It can also go in the life science glove box in an express rack, uh, and you can rapidly freeze samples to uh, minus 
185C. And then there's a passive rapid freezing capability that uses the uh, cold block to get them to, in a mini cold bag, uh, which is also very useful. Um, so I thought I'd show you some actual data. This is the only data I'm showing in the presentation. But if you were to put a sample directly into Melty, we have temperature uh, starting at room temperature up here. And this elapsed time is in minutes. So for instance, uh, to get to zero, it takes maybe uh, 10 minutes to get down to zero degrees centigrade. And then if you want to get down to 20 degrees, it takes maybe 36 to 40 minutes. I'm going to use the passive rapid freezing capability I referred to in the previous slide. This acts is now in seconds. So we can go from room temperature 20 uh, to about minus 0 to minus 20 in 100 seconds. Uh, and then you keep it in longer, 200 seconds, you can reach uh, minus 80 C. Uh, but the Cadillac here is glove box freezer. So this is an active freezer unit. And you can go from uh, room temperature uh, down to minus 80 in a second. So it's you know, about 80 seconds. Uh, of course, there's differences based on your sample size and the type of sample. But that just kind of gives you a feel for these capabilities. The, uh, the folks at BioServe have developed a very useful uh, hardware called the uh, Fruit Activation Pack Fluid Processing Apparatus, or GAP at FDA. And it's essentially a uh, glorified uh, test tube with a plunger. Uh, and you can load it up with different liquid uh, treatments. Uh, uh, you press down on the plunger. You can force the liquids you know, through this bypass to mix together. So you can have a, a, an experiment that you initiate on stage, uh, and you also fix on stage. And they can be uh, housed in either a hand-operated unit, or you have a picture of the astronauts just turning a crank, so there's a series of eight fluid processing apparatus tubes are all activated and processed at the same time. There's also an automated uh, version, uh, which you know, would be very useful, let's say, on uh, Gateway. Uh, BioServe also has a, a very good uh, incubator called Sable, the safe automated um, uh, bioponic lab. Uh, it can control temperatures from minus 5 to 43 degrees centigrade. There's currently three on ISS. Uh, and it can also provide an atmosphere control of 5% CO2. So uh, these are uh, workhorses, and, and they come with a color touch screen for the astronaut to do some programming from the front of the unit. <coughs> so BioServe also has these uh, BioCells, which is a family of cell culture hard hardware analogous to a typical uh, cell culture flask or multi-well culture plate. Uh, they can handle ESL level 2 organisms. They're often used uh, in conjunction with the stable incubator for temperature control. And they, they come in uh, a single well version, a six well version, and a 12 well version. And they're uh, they can have customizable membranes and gas exchange. They're autoclavable. You can gamma radiate them, uh, compatible with temperatures from minus 80 to plus 43 C. They have in the outlet sampling ports for fluid injection, media exchanging, fixation, and cover, um, culture preservation. So then, uh, this is the advanced plant habitat, which we started using this past year. Uh, it's a large plant growth volume habitat. It's about the same volume and the same area as veggie, but it uh, provides a completely defined environment. 
So there's uh, temperature control, relative humidity control, CO2 concentration control, uh, FO probing, and, and oxygen can also be controlled. It can support uh, plant experiments up to 135 days. Uh, it's pretty complex. It's over 180 calibrated sensors within it. And it contains what's referred to as a science carrier. This is a science carrier uh, that the uh, PI can load up with two, three, four. Each can be independently controlled in terms of wetness level set points, for instance, or you could put different substrates for different levels of fertilizer pellets in them. Uh, and then there's also an oxygen sensor in buried in the substrate in each of the four parts. And it has uh, three imaging uh, uh, cameras, uh, two color cameras. This is a top view from the top camera. This is a side view from the side view camera. And then there's an infrared camera for dark cycle imaging. So I'm going to try and do something here. I hope you can still see this. Oops. did a, uh, a validation test with wheat and Arabidopsis on ISF, demonstrating that it works, that it's the hand of God harvest of the Arabidopsis compared to um, wheat. And it worked very well. So let's see here. This is, and then I have another little video for you. Uh, this is Radish, our, uh, our next PI. Actually, the experiment launched last week out of uh, Wallops. Uh, and this is a, uh, what we call PHO2 with Carl Hosenstein as the PI. So the top view of the Radish in two separate experiments, uh, different conditions, slightly different results. Uh, uh, so we're very excited about getting that uh, started. Here's the, the radish from the ground study from Dr. Hardenstein's uh, pre-flight work. And pretty soon in the pipeline, there'll be a pepper experiment called that PHO4. And just some uh, specs to uh, the advanced plant habitat. And the, the Japanese state, uh, state agency, JAXA, has their uh, very reliable cell biology experiment facility. Yes. Uh, Howard, can we go back to presentation mode, please? Oh, yes. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, this is uh, very good at cultivating cells and plants. It can run automatically. It can change remotely. It has an incubator with both a microgravity and 1G compartment. So uh, the uh, uh, centrifuge can go from 0.1 to 2G. Uh, here's the temperature range, humidity, CO2 concentration. So this is kind of an all-in-one uh, uh, hardware facility uh, on station. And then uh, the cubes. Uh, cubes are um, uh, very useful devices. You can have a, uh, this is a single cube called 1U. Uh, it's uh, 10 centimeters on a side, 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters, 10 centimeters high. That's referred to as 1U. But you can have a 2U configuration, a 4U, a 6U, an 8U, a 9U. So they're scalable. Uh, and they, uh, being used all over the country by, by different groups and students, and you can buy a lot of uh, uh, prefabricated uh, uh, capabilities just off the shelf. So it's very useful. Uh, so there's two main uh, groups that I'm aware of, Tango Lab. Uh, they have a powered asset utility locker that can be used to accommodate CQ Labs that need continuous power during launch. And the other one is uh, NanoRack. 
uh, who has had for a number of years two nano lab facilities uh, on station that, that can be populated with different uh, cubes. Uh, they're getting ready to launch their next generation anode uh, uh, facility, which will replace uh, one nano rack platform uh, this coming year, and presumably the other one soon. They can each accommodate up to 12. Uh, single cube, uh, but of course you can do the different cube configuration. This is a 1.5 U unit that was used to grow some plants in space. And then the cube can also be used uh, independently as a, a, a nano satellite. And uh, this has been pioneered out of a research center. Uh, so you can have uh, two cubes, let's say, with your science and another cube that kind of uh, sends the data down to a, uh, a station that receives it on Earth. So these don't come back, you know, but they're free flying nano satellites and there's a variety of different kinds of science experiments that can be conducted using this particular uh, capability. And then another uh, system came out of the Peace Research Center is bioculture. Again, there's a lot of cell biology and microbiology experiments. They can be initiated on order, either automatically or manually. Uh, typically, biotubes carry active experiments to ISS and return, but the docking station uh, can remain uh, on station with unpowered success. And independent concepts uh, can share a single gas supply. Again, it has temperature control of 5 to 42 degrees. This is useful. It's divided into two zones. So you can have an incubation zone for the biochamber and an insulated cold zone for the culture medium or whatever, so that you can keep things cold prior to uh, use. Uh, supports up to 16 accessory solution bags for additive sensors, et cetera, and it can uh, uh, handle biosafety level 2 critters and, and chemicals up to toxicological level hazard 2. So then uh, uh, I was going to include a, uh, a slide on BioRack, which was a, a favorite shuttle days, but BioRack is no longer it replaced essentially with URI, uh, made by this company, Green Gravity, Germany. And again, I'm not all that familiar with this, but uh, they're very similar. They, they use a type 1 container like BioRack did. Uh, they have a single one new science box that you can put these different type 1 containers in. There's an observation unit that you can actually uh, uh, examine visually. Uh, results from your experiment. And they have this science taxi facility. If you look at Walker's size, we went to Pennsylvania, quite a few of their uh, experiments. It has a centrifuge that can do 1G lunar or Martian gravity control temperature, can go on SpaceX, Dream Chaser, and fully automated. And you know, it could be used in a uh, free flyer. Uh, and the storage facility as well with the centrifuge uh, for ISS operation. So this is a very flexible unit and I think it's going to be very popular in years to come. Then there's Mobile Space Lab by HNU Photonics. So uh, this supports quick turnaround live cell culture experiments that can go up to a month with automatic microfluidic delivery of reagents and automated phase contrast and fluorescent microscopy. So that's very useful at no crew time or crew manipulations required. Uh, you can do uh, fixation uh, in flight. Uh, and they have under development the biochip space lab, uh, which will it should be ready in two years. Uh, that's similar to the JAXA PDF. It has a centrifuge uh, up here for microgravity capability uh, to refer a 
the theta 1G or multigraphy condition, uh, uh, microgravity condition. So uh, I've gone very quickly, and again, I'm not a big expert on all of these hardware. Some of them I know quite a bit about, but these are the different hardware types that I've spoken about. And here are the people who are uh, good points of contact if you wish to find out more information. And for that, I thank you for your participation. Great. Thanks a lot for that, Howard. Um, so if you have questions, please type those into the Q&A panel in the meeting. Uh, I think we had one question about is there a document that, that where you could get information about all these. I'm hoping that you covered that in your last slide with who the contacts are. Um, yeah, I tried to include a lot of details in the individual slides, uh, but yeah, for more details, you'll have to go to the individual points of contact on that map. Great. And then we will be trying to make these videos available to uh, the community. That will probably be done through YouTube, and we'll probably even send you a direct link to access those. You won't be able to find them by searching. So uh, we'll let you know how to do that by email, probably later today or tomorrow. Uh, Howard, can you comment at all on each what hardware do you think would be most likely to be used, say, someplace like Gateway to begin? Well, so Gateway uh, uh, isn't going to have that much uh, external capability or experiment using hardware associated with it. I mean, it's all being worked out. Uh, it's also not going to have that much crew time available. I mean, the crew is going to visit periodically for you know, some period of time. Uh, I'm not sure exactly. It might be one month, might be up to three months, but in general, you know, it's going to be unoccupied most of the time. Uh, so um, that's uh, especially that's why I kind of included a lot of the really simple brick containers uh, up front uh, and the uh, the automated hardware, which is very good. Many experiments don't take that long, so uh, they could be conducted uh, using the existing hardware brought up to Gateway uh, for the time that the astronauts are up there. So and then there's a request. If you could just put the slide back up with the list of contacts on it, that would be helpful. Yeah, that one. Can you make it full screen? There you go. And then uh, there's another question here. Uh, let's see. Why is minus 150 degree required in space? Can a plant survive this temperature? <laughs> uh, no, it's it, it, so usually when you do an experiment in space, uh, you want to avoid bringing it back to Earth because the readaptation uh, during the, the landing uh, process. And you know, you do an experiment in say microgravity, you want to see microgravity effect. So the two ways uh, commonly used uh, to avoid that readaptation artifact is to either fix your plants or your specimen chemically, say with formaldehyde or butyraldehyde or RNA later, or uh, to freeze them. So uh, many, many investigators actually prefer to freeze their specimens instead of uh, chemically fixing them prior to return. So that's, that's what those temperatures are for. They're for freezing and stopping the activity of the biology while it's under microgravity conditions. Here's another question. It says the existing hardware options and control capabilities are very impressive. I'm wondering what hardware capabilities would jump. I can't seem to scroll it back. I can read it for you, um, Bruce. It says okay. existing hardware options and control capabilities are really impressive. I am wondering what hardware capabilities does the panel wish they had that has not yet been available to the science community? What hardware limitations might limit science? Uh, 
Howard, do you want to take that? Well, you know, uh, one of the great things that the uh, uh, International Space Station has provided, provided us with, the researchers, is an increasing capability for doing science on ISS. So there are facilities there that uh, you probably won't have uh, available, at least short term, on places like Gateway and on the lunar surface. Now, we would hope that eventually those capabilities would become available, but for instance, uh, microscopy. Uh, you know, you always want to use the microscope, and then uh, there's uh, you know, PCR, you know, the, the typical uh, gene expression type hardware. We have some of that, like wet lab on, on the International Space Station. So it's, it, I would just say that you know, we would eventually hope that we would have uh, similar capabilities that currently exist on the International Space Station, both as a uh, gateway, you know, probably scale down that capability, and then eventually on the lunar surface. Now on the lunar surface, you can think of it short term and long term. In the short term, there'll be very little you know, capability, but eventually we're going to have habitat there, and probably, uh, you know, what I love is when you see a, a lunar habitat, you know, right next to it, you usually see a greenhouse uh, module, and you could also have a science module with all these different kinds of extra capabilities for doing uh, more intensive science. So it all depends on your time scale. So uh, I might add to what Howard was just saying, this is Charlie Quincy. Uh, the National Academy is beginning a review of, of where we're heading now for the next 10 years. And part of the reason we're doing this series is to make sure that we ask them to include in their final report uh, the, the technologies and capabilities that we feel are needed at the gateway on the lunar surface, in addition to what we have on station and our Earth space uh, platforms. Thanks, Charlie. Howard, in your answer there, you mentioned sequencing and PCR. Um, can you talk about, a little bit about how well or what the challenges of doing that on the ISS has been? Well, it's, uh, I'm not actually uh, involved in, in those studies uh, directly. Uh, the nice thing about the capabilities they have is that uh, it means that you can analyze your samples on orbit. Uh, so again, you avoid having to freeze them or fix them in RNA later to bring them back. Uh, uh, and of course, I guess the other main problem is it takes crew time. And crew time is something that's uh, very limited. So uh, they're good capabilities to have. It's just another um, you know, additional science capability. Uh, but it doesn't come uh, without a cost in terms of requiring crew time. Yeah, th thanks for that, Howard. I think some of the PCR experiments have been difficult because it's, it's difficult to get the fluids positioned correctly in the wells and, and also yeah, just the way fluids affects in space can be a bit challenging. So while they have that capability up there, so it's probably an area that, would you agree that's an area that we probably need to continue to work on to get those, that equipment to work better in space or be more easy for an astronaut to use? Uh, yeah, well, we've had a, you know, pretty much a revolution in, let's say, the last 10 years with, you know, being able to do all this uh, omics work, uh, 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 transcriptomics, proteomics, metabolomics. Uh, and it's been very insightful uh, in terms of being able to see, uh, you know, there are, there are many genes that are uh, upregulated and expressed to a higher degree in space, and many of them are downregulated or expressed to a lesser degree, and some are, don't change at all in terms of how much they're regulated. So this is uh, very insightful in terms of how microgravity uh, provides a uh, uh, different condition, uh, and you can learn quite a bit that can be applied uh, on Earth because you're essentially studying chemical pathways and, and metabolism. metabolism. Uh, and it's uh, what I always like to say is 
the ability to conduct experiments in space uh, is, is analogous to, uh, let's say, when the electron microscope was first invented. It, it opened up a whole new world capabilities and expanded the questions that we could ask because we never had that uh, capability before, but we never had the capability of studying organisms under microgravity conditions either. You know, all organisms have evolved under 1G conditions, and so this is a completely new experimental treatment, and it can be very insightful what you can learn uh, by studying, you know, in this particular instance, what happens to their genes uh, in space. Yeah, I, I would fully second second that, Howard. And, you know, you also have uh, metabolomics there, which reminds me of, you know, there are capabilities that we don't really have, at least that I'm aware of in space so far. Like, you know, we don't have the GC mass specs. It's not easy to run that kind of level of metabolomics in space. So the samples need to be returned to Earth uh, for doing those studies. And so. You know, things that would be great to have that we don't have are, are getting the size of the sample down for doing metabolomics and then having equipment that's super easy to use so that you can just put the sample in there and get the answers out, right? This is, I mean, if you really think about what's happening in terms of sequencing and everything else, that's basically what's happening. It's all going to these microfluidic formats, which are very small, very easy to use, and use very small sample sizes get great information from that. And, you know, we really need things that are, are very simple to use in space and don't take up a lot of room in the spacecraft that weigh very much and don't have very high power requirements. And also that are extraordinarily sensitive so that we can get, you know, gene expression is great, but I don't know, I've done an awful lot of protein work in my career and proteins don't necessarily match what you're seeing in the gene expression data. So then that's where metabolomics or proteomics comes in. And then, of course, the metabolomics may not match that because of protein regulation. So you really need all those different angles of science to come together to, to paint the whole picture of what's going on. So I guess that's my, my thinking on that. Yeah, no, I agree with that. And, and, and that's the uh, proteomics. It, it takes the products that are produced through transcriptomics, and, and it, you can see that there is you know, what we refer to as post-translational modification. So uh, the polypeptides that are produced can be modified, you know, after they're being produced. So uh, I second that comment. Thanks, Howard. So there's a question from a student here. It says, what research gaps do you think students should think about solving now in preparation for future space hardware? Well, so uh, that's an excellent question. Uh, and, and what I'll say is that uh, many of the challenges for uh, growing plants in space uh, uh, that we saw early on are uh, related to uh, the lack of convection so that, uh, let's say, uh, CO2 immediately uh, adjacent to the plant leaves would be taken up and there was no convective mixing to refresh the CO2. Well, we solved that problem just by using forced air convection or fans. Uh, so uh, we've gradually solved uh, some of the problems. We've increased the light intensity of the light emitting diodes that have evolved very quickly over time. I would say that the major challenge that currently exists is what's happening in the root zone. As you know, roots um, respire just like us. They, they require oxygen for respiration. And in the root zone, when you add water, uh, you don't have gravity helping to pull the water downward. Uh, so sometimes you'll have big globs of water and you don't necessarily want them. And they can essentially uh, create uh, flooding conditions and inhibit oxygen diffusion to the roots. So uh, this problem of, you know, have the right amount of water where you want it, and having sufficient oxygen in the root zone is probably the major problem that currently exists, at least with, with plant growth. Thanks, Howard. Uh, another question is, are larger scale centrifuge capabilities planned for growing crops on, on any space? 
I would, I would guess, you know, let's do ISS, Gateway, Mars Transit. Well, ISS, there were, at one, at one point, there was a plan for a very large centrifuge, you know, that would have these uh, facilities that were designed specifically for it, you know, uh, like double mid-deck locker type facilities. Um, of course, one of my favorite movie is uh, 2001 Space Odyssey, where you have the space station that actually uh, rotates and, and gives an artificial gravity. Uh, there are some uh, designs for different size uh, centrifuges. Uh, there's a human level centrifuge that can be uh, uh, implemented uh, if there's the will to do it so that crew members could uh, you know, sit within the centrifuge and be spun for a certain, certain period of time each day as a countermeasure to the detrimental effects of microgravity. Uh, some folks uh, talk about on transit to Mars that, you know, there should be uh, a centrifuge uh, or at least a, a rotation of the vehicle, at least part of it, on the way to Mars so that the crew doesn't deteriorate uh, prior to landing on Mars. You could just think of if the crew has to go to Mars uh, under completely microgravity conditions, it takes six months to get there. And, by the time they're there, you know, there's a uh, deterioration of their muscle mass and, and their bones as well. And then maybe uh, you know, they hit their forearm on the table and uh, get a fracture. But there's quite, quite a bit of conversation about that. But it's not currently uh, the implementation plan that I'm aware of. It's more of a wish list kind of thing. Of course, on the moon, uh, yeah, <coughs> excuse me. And, and one sixty a lot better than zero. Uh, at least you have some gravity, you know. On uh, on Mars, you have four tenths of a G, so that uh, uh, that's you know not as good as one G, but it's still it makes a big difference if you have uh, partial gravity than if you have absolutely. So uh, that's one nice thing about going back to the moon is that if you can have uh, devices that function on the moon at 1.6G, uh, they will likely have no problem on Mars at 4 tenths of a G. Yeah, and I, I would just second that, Howard. We, we hear a lot of different meetings that we're in that, you know, if we can make it work on the moon, then it will definitely work on Mars. And, you know, so in a lot of ways, the moon is a, is a test bed for for those future landings on the moon. We really need this equipment to work well on the moon. If anything goes wrong on the moon, you get home in a couple of days. If something goes wrong on Mars, you need to fix the problem while you're there, because you're not coming back to Earth anytime soon. And, uh, you know, you also brought up another, another thing, so something else students might want to be thinking about, or I know we're starting to look at... Uh, fluid flow problems and reduced gravity, right? We've looked at microgravity and we know Earth gravity well, but we need to understand exactly how thick boundary layers and things like that are going to be in these fluids and how, they, how they're going to handle under, under lunar gravity. We think it's going to work well enough, but you now we really need to understand that to make sure it's going to work well enough at this point in time. And following up on that, Bruce, um, because it's so difficult and expensive uh, to get opportunities to fly in space, uh, different groups around the world, Europe and Japan, have uh, invested in, in what we refer to as microgravity simulators. Uh, these are devices that rotate uh, your experimental organism so that you don't uh, uh, get rid of gravity, but uh, gravity is constantly coming from a different direction. You can sum the vectors of, of gravity over time. It sums to zero. So it's a way to simulate microgravity. Again, uh, don't get me wrong, it's not real microgravity. There's other artifacts that you have to be uh, careful of. But you can also simulate uh, lunar or Martian gravity using these devices. So that's a much more uh, economically uh, viable uh, way of doing it, 
and towards that end, uh, we have established at Kennedy Space Center a microgravity simulation support facility where we have gradually been building up uh, a certain capability for doing microgravity simulation experiments with different kinds of microgravity simulators, both uh, food climastat, 3D climastat, random position machines, so that um, investigators, usually investigators that uh, are successful in obtaining grants uh, can come to Kennedy Space Center and perform experiments, but there is some uh, capability for outside investigators to come as well. Great. Well, I think we're at our at time now, so I'd really like to thank you, Howard, for taking the time to spend with us today on presenting the, the hardware that we're currently using on the space station and, and have used also on the shuttle as well. Um, so thanks again for uh, your great presentation today, and uh, with that, I'd like to close the seminar. All right. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Thanks. Bye now.